Uh, we'll have lots of viewers on Cable 14, and we thank Cable 14 for uh, recording uh, this production, and I'm sure we'll be airing it throughout the uh, holiday season, so happy holidays, everybody. And thank you to Ham Aunt and uh, Joey Coleman for live streaming tonight's uh, very important uh, discussion. Uh, important to note that this issue of uh, two-way streets and complete streets is not a novel idea. The motion uh, that we'll take a look at in just a moment here is a motion uh, that uh, simply brings a new tack to an old initiative, uh, the Hamilton Transportation Master Plan. And uh, we'll also speak tonight, I'm, I'm sure, about the future and uh, maybe get a jump on the uh, pedestrian mobility plan, which none of you can see. This is a draft I hold in my hands. But very soon it will be a public document, and it's long anticipated uh, for we councillors, and I'm sure many of the people in this room, and we'll hear references of the TMP, the Transportation Master Plan, at points throughout this evening, and I'm sure to the uh, pedestrian mobility plan, or PMP. I think it all started, uh, at least this motion uh, began, and we... Uh, 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 sort of created some uh, uh, a lot of awareness and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of interest in uh, September September the sixth specifically with this emotion that was unanimously approved by council uh, on September twelfth with ratification. It was moved by Councillor Brian McCaddy of Ward One, and I seconded this uh, representing Ward Two. And here it is on the screen. Whereas there are over one hundred one way streets remaining in Hamilton. Where Whereas, increasingly, there appears to be a strong convergence of public opinion in Hamilton in favor of converting one-way street conversion to benefit adjacent retail businesses, slow traffic, improve pedestrian movements, and generally increase livability in neighborhoods, especially in downtown Hamilton. Whereas the 2008 City of Hamilton Transportation Master Plan included recommendations on a number of one-way street conversions which have not yet taken place, Whereas the one-way street conversions that have taken place on James, on John, on York, Wilson, Caroline, Hess, and Park are to be completed soon. Well, that was Park, but the rest have taken place, and they have been successful. Whereas city staff generally are supportive of one-way conversions, but require strong and unequivocal political support to move ahead with adequate financial resources. And whereas the majority of one-way streets exist in wards one and two. Therefore, be it resolved, and again, I reiterate, this was unanimously supported by council, that A, a ward one, two, and three, one-way to two-way street study group be established to study and report on possible one-way street conversions in the downtown area, specifically Cannon Street and Queen Street, to inform the requisite environmental assessments, and B, that staff be directed to prepare a budget for the study for consideration during the 2013 budgetary process. And that budgetary process is on now and we expect that that will wrap up uh, sometime uh, closing in on March, if not March, in the early stages of that month. Little program note just as we get going here. Um, we again are very fortunate to have a large group of folks here in the gallery and of course those watching at home and uh, on the live stream today. Um, we're, uh, we'll have a brief intermission before we get to you and your questions and your comments and your concerns to our panel of experts and counselors. And I should also note that uh, Councillor Bernie Morelli will be here very soon. He's at the uh, Hamilton Police Services meeting as we speak. But at that intermission stage, you'll have an opportunity, if you like what you hear, and we hope you do, to fill out uh, an information card that offers your contact information and breaks down where you may be interested in getting involved with this study group as we see before us in the resolution supported by Council. Over recent times, and, and from well over a decade ago, we've heard from the experts on this subject. Richard Florida, the highly regarded U of T planner, lectured all over North America on this and all over North America on those planning principles that bring urban sustainability. And he's been here in Hamilton on a few occasions. And he argues that, quote, the creative class, end quote, these skilled people with a wide range of fields, including finance and high tech and science and healthcare and law and the arts and others, careers and, and uh, employment uh, opportunities and professionals we want to see here in the inner city, they are, quote, the engine of the economy. These people are attracted to locations where they can enjoy diversity and a high quality of life, end quote. And that's from his 2002 book, 
the rise of the creative class. And I know as the representative for Ward 2 here in downtown Hamilton, I hear loudly from the creative class that two-way and or complete streets corresponds with a high quality of life. The think tank, we can go back to 1977 and the think tank Partners for Livable Communities, they're around the world now, on urban prosperity, maintain that to succeed in the new economy, cities will need to be attractive. Attractive as places to live and to work. Two-way and, and complete streets, they're attractive. And they're also safe. And they share, the think tank, the Partners for Livable Communities, they share that it is, quote, safe and convenient for travel by automobile, by foot, by bicycle, and transit for everyone in the community, regardless of age or ability, end quote. And in 2009, they even honored the AARP, that's the American Association of Retired Persons, for a study that showed nearly 50% of older adults say they cannot safely cross main roads close to their homes. The study discusses how the concept of, quote, complete streets, end quote, can improve the mobility of older adults. A public opinion telephone survey of 50 plus populations, an online survey of more than a thousand transportation planners and engineers, and an inventory of 80 existing state complete street policies informed that study back in 2009. Little local history on tonight's topic, ladies and gentlemen. The Hamilton Society of Architects had a Hamilton downtown charrette June 1996. Two days of ideas from 120 architects, urban designers, landscape architects, developers, local business people, planners, realtors, bankers, politicians, and a whole lot of local residents. And they walked the core for two days and they came away with 10 recommendations. And of them, do away with one way on James Street and King Street. Our downtown plan mission statement from more than a decade ago includes this, quote, the downtown Hamilton of the future will be a vibrant focus of attraction where all of our diverse people can live, work, and play. The future downtown must be built on a human scale with streetscapes offering comfort, access, and safety for pedestrians." End quote. The vision is drawn directly from the Longo Report taking place in Hamilton in 1998 that was entitled Downtown, a Marketplace for Ideas. And the report draws out five lessons in the end. And of the five, in that summary, traffic patterns that favor pedestrians, support increased use of public transit, and calm automobile traffic to help downtown become a culture, shopping, and leisure destination for the region. Again, that's back in the 90s, 1998. After tonight, we expect to add greatly to what has become a growing list of support for these concepts before us, the concepts of two-way or complete streets. From the PTA at Dr. Davey, and I see some parents here tonight, uh, to those of the NEN, and some of you are here awaiting the OMB verdict on your North End Child and Family Friendly Streets proposal, to the Cork Towners who asked and received a pedestrian activated light on Augusta and John, to the Duranders whose membership includes great people on this topic, well-informed people who have been preaching for years on this, like Nicholas Kevlahan. He says and hammers this fact home that we shouldn't fear this. And I think it's a very important point. And I hope Nick speaks tonight. I know he's here. He says, quote, we're not suggesting closing streets off or even reducing lanes, end quote. We have lots of support. The Chamber of Commerce, they've offered to be part of the consultation process with their membership. They've already started to work on the issue. With respect to residential street conversions long ago presented through a council-supported transportation master plan, or the TMP as it will be referred to many times tonight, Brad Clark, the councillor from Stony Creek, has already asked for the record, on the record, what's taking so long. He's eager to move on this aspect of the TMP, particularly as it relates to residential streets. And in the first quarter in 2013, as I mentioned, the long-awaited pedestrian mobility plan will come before this council and be debated, and I very much look forward to that. I've had a chance to look at it, and I know Councillor McHattie has as well, and it's, I think, very encouraging. So let's get started. Tonight's panel includes Councillor Bernie Morelli. He is currently busy with the uh, Hamilton Police Services Board meeting. He'll be here imminently. Councillor Brian McCaddy will speak in a bit. He's going to introduce the concept of a stakeholder study group and share his presentation on the processes, past and present, sharing his perspective, and in some cases, I'm sure, frustrations. Steve Malloy is here. Steve, if you just want to raise your hand. 
Steve's the project manager with the transportation master plan. Steve will break down the TMP and explain how the environmental assessment process relates to it. And it's an important process and one we're going to do with hopefully a lot of you as well. We'll have a, a public EA as well. Sharon McKinnon is here. There's Sharon over there. She's a public health nurse with the city of Hamilton and she's here to explain the public health benefits of complete streets. That will be engaging and she'll be up shortly. And Peter Topolovic is also here. Many of you know Peter. Peter's the project manager with transportation demand management and he's going to talk about balanced transportation. But we're going to start with a well-known urban prosperity advocate. The developer of Raise the Hammer, a popular local media website that sees several thousand hits per day, focusing on our city's potential, dedicated to making Hamilton a more vibrant, livable, and attractive place to live and work. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan McGreal. Thanks, Councillor Farr. I feel a little intimidated by that introduction. Okay, can everyone hear me? Wonderful. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, oops, that's not right. Sorry, technical difficulties here. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. That was raised the hammer, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> Got to take advantage of every opportunity. Uh, so first of all, before we talk about complete streets, let's talk about traffic. What is traffic? Uh, normally when you hear about traffic in the news or in discussion, traffic means people in cars. But, uh, but in fact, traffic just means people. People going from somewhere to somewhere else. Uh, people on foot, people on bicycles, people on skateboards, uh, people on transit, uh, and people in cars as well. But uh, the important thing about traffic is that we have to understand that traffic is people going from somewhere to somewhere else. And our streets shouldn't require that people all use the same mode no matter where they're going. So a complete street is a street that lets people travel in a variety of different ways. On foot, on bicycle, in transit, in a car, on a skateboard, all these different things. Uh, it makes space for everybody in every mode, not just for cars. Uh, and it brings people into contact safely. This is, you know, one of the crucial aspects. Uh, of course, on a street that is dominated by cars, the last thing you want is for people coming into contact. Uh, but on a complete street, that's different. It's actually a positive thing. Uh, and so a complete street finds a way to balance the competing needs of different modes so that there's room for everybody. Oh, is that better? Okay, thanks. Um, so some characteristics of a complete street, um, wide sidewalks uh, with trees, uh, trees are really important, lots uh, of easy pedestrian crossings, you know, places where you can get from one side to the other without having to walk a half a kilometer out of your way, uh, fewer and narrower driving lanes, um, uh, dedicated bike lanes, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and uh, most importantly, places for people to meet up. Again, a uh, complete street is a street that encourages people to come into contact in safe and productive ways. And, uh, and there's a lot of social and, in fact, economic benefits to that. So this is just a picture of a before and after. On the top there, you had, um, obviously, a car-dominated street. It's like four or five lanes of traffic, narrow little ribbons of sidewalk, um, very intimidating, very car-centric. On the bottom now, you have a much different characterization. You have wider sidewalks. You have a shade. You've got uh, dedicated separate bike lanes. You've got a nice, well-marked pedestrian crossing. Uh, there's still room for cars, but they no longer dominate the street. Um, you know, again, you've got sidewalks, bike lanes, this is a close-up here. You've got uh, two lanes of uh, car traffic. You've got two lanes of bicycle traffic. You've got a sidewalk that's wide enough for five people to walk abreast. Um, I know on too many of Hamilton sidewalks, particularly around the downtown, my 10-year-old son and I actually can't walk side by side. We sort of have to do this shuffle. And uh, that's, that's not conducive to getting out and walking. So again, uh, we have another example here. 
the, the trees are important. You know, certainly in the summer, it provides a cooling and shading effect. Another thing it does is psychologically, it tells drivers to slow down. When the street, you know, is kind of shaped like an arch, it almost feels like you're inside a defined space. And all the psychological message to drivers, opposing traffic, lots of crossings, is that there are things they need to watch out for and that they should slow down and be more careful. And that, in fact, translates into uh, a lot of real benefits, which I'll talk about. So uh, this is actually a photograph of uh, a square in the south of France. Uh, I was there and I was immediately struck by the similarity to Gore Park, uh, except that this one was full of people. Um, and the main reason is that it's not surrounded by highways on both sides. People can walk to it, they can enjoy it. There are uh, you know, streets that are, well, you know, buildings that have cafes that open up, there are places to sit, places to socialize. Uh, there's a market that's outdoors here every Wednesday afternoon, and, uh, and the place is full of people. So what complete streets do? First of all, they reduce speeding automobiles. Um, in Hamilton, uh, we have lots of, of streets that are really designed to facilitate high-speed traffic. Not just cars going the speed limit, but cars exceeding the speed limit. And in fact, cars going, even when they're at the speed limit, 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers an hour is far too high for a street in a built-up urbanized area. Uh, complete streets encourage people to walk. The safer it is to walk, the friendlier it is to walk, the more attractive it is to walk, people will walk more. Similarly with, with cycling. Uh, city after city around the world, no matter what the climate is like, no matter what you know, the topology is like, if you create um, an environment that is conducive to cycling with dedicated bike lanes that actually connect to each other, then more people ride bicycles and cycling increases and increases. Uh, and then finally, again, it encourages meetings and chance encounters, which um, all the research that's been done into economic development over the past 30 or 40 years, it's increasingly focused on the role of chance encounters in um, actually facilitating innovation, facilitating economic growth. Uh, cities that bring people into contact in a very organic way grow faster than cities that don't. So some more benefits of complete streets. They're safer for all users, including drivers. Uh, this is one of the interesting things that came out of the research that I've been doing is that, um, you know, when you put in dedicated bike lanes, when you widen sidewalks, when you plant trees, when you convert to two-way, the number of accidents for cyclists and pedestrians goes down, but the number of accidents for drivers goes down as well. Um, uh, on Jarvis Street in Toronto, which uh, bike lanes were put in and then two, later, two years later the bike lanes were uh, very unceremoniously taken out, but in that time the number of cyclists on the street tripled and the number of accidents dropped by 23%. Uh, that's in accidents involving all vehicles, including cars. Um, again, you have increased neighborhood interaction. You have, uh, you know, uh, so socially it becomes better. You have more people out on the street. You have violence goes down. People feel more comfortable to walk around their own communities. Uh, local businesses definitely benefit. The more people you have walking around, the more business those places are going to make. Uh, and you have just generally an improved quality of life for everyone who lives and works around there. Uh, now, I've mentioned speed and speeding vehicles. Um, you know, the engineers will certainly correct me if I'm wrong in this, but uh, the, the energy of a vehicle is related to the square of its speed. So if you take a vehicle that's going a certain speed and double it, you've actually quadrupled that vehicle's destructive capacity. You've quadrupled uh, the stopping distance. Uh, and uh, that is borne out in the statistics. At uh, 32 kilometers an hour, which is roughly the speed that North End neighbors want to set as a speed limit for that community, the risk of a pedestrian being killed in a collision with a car is 5%. At uh, 48 kilometers an hour, that risk jumps to 45%. And at 64 kilometers an hour, which is the front of the green wave on Main Street, uh, that drops to, jumps to 85%. So um, just bringing the speed of cars down dramatically reduces the risk of being killed if you get hit. And at the same time, it reduces the risk of getting hit in the first place because as the stopping distance shrinks, uh, drivers have more of an opportunity to stop and get out of the way so that the collision doesn't happen in the first place. So I want to talk just a little bit specifically about one way to two-way conversion because it's so uh, important for Hamilton right now. Um, our one-way streets uh, were designed um, as such and implemented in 1956 uh, by an American traffic engineer named Wilbur Smith who basically traveled to cities all over North America that had been built before cars and suddenly had to accommodate cars. And he came up with this idea that if you have paired one-way thoroughfares, you can funnel huge volumes of traffic through the city very quickly. Uh, now, 
in fairness to him, he was remarkably successful at achieving this. Unfortunately, the price that we've had to pay in, in vitality and quality of life in other areas has been enormous. Um, a study that was conducted uh, using Hamilton data and published in 2000 in a peer-reviewed public health journal found that children on a one-way street are uh, two and a half more times likely to be killed, uh, sorry, to be injured than on a two-way street. So the, the data really is there. It supports the fact that one-way streets are more dangerous than two-way streets. You have faster vehicle speeds. Uh, you have fewer uh, impediments. You know, the, as a driver, you get into your one-way street, it feels like a highway, and you just go. You know, whereas on the two-way street, you're more alert. So there's lots of issues around speed and driver inattention. People behave differently on one-way streets than on two-way streets. Uh, two-way streets are certainly better for local street retail. Uh, we've seen this in city after city that's taken those one-way streets that they converted around the same time we did. They've converted them back to two-way, and they've immediately seen large increases in business. Uh, on James Street North and John Street North, they were converted to two-way in 2002. And uh, so I contacted the James North business, or sorry, the downtown business improvement area, and they surveyed their members after the conversion. And uh, what the businesses said was that business had gone up, uh, sales were up, some places had hired more people. They very generally saw a benefit to it. Um, one of the benefits, quite simply, is that motorists can approach from either direction. So it's not just, again, it's not just a benefit for people who aren't driving, but people who are driving actually are safer on two-way streets and have more flexibility in how to get where they're going. Uh, this is a quote from a business owner. Uh, this is May 1957 on King Street. Seven months after the streets were converted to one way, uh, a group of business owners descended on the Public Works Committee, and he said, um, he told them, our windows are no good nowadays. People have no time to stop and look. Nobody comes from the west end of the city anymore. We would like to see King Street two-way once more. That was May 1957. This is May 2012. Another business owner also on King Street. He said, tried to tell someone to find our store from the west end. It's a complex set of directions, wastes both time and gas, creates more travel time, and really thwarts our accessibility to customers. For a retailer, making it hard for a customer is never a good thing. So again, in well over 50 years now, businesses have been telling us the same thing. Uh, Two-way um, also supports LRT. Hamilton, for a number of years now, has had uh, been building plans to build an east-west LRT line running from McMaster through the downtown out to uh, the east end. And uh, uh, the uh, Metrolinx, which is the uh, provincial organization, they did a benefits case analysis, and they actually found that the LRT will be more successful if we convert Maine and King to two-way. Uh, earlier this year, McMaster Institute of Logistics and Transportation did their own study for Hamilton, and they came to the same conclusion. They said that LRT will be more successful at uh, not only at attracting riders, but also at, um, at attracting new private investment if uh, we convert those streets to two-way. So this idea that, well, we can't touch those streets because of LRT, and we're not going to get LRT for 10 years, it's just an excuse not to make any of the differences. Um, and finally, the one argument we keep hearing about two-way streets is that it'll somehow create gridlock, right? Um, and that's just, it's not the case. It hasn't been the case in any places that have done it. Uh, one of the remarkable things uh, that happens when you convert a street to two-way is that some of the traffic simply disappears. Uh, a lot of the traffic that is on our streets in Hamilton, it's called induced demand. It's cars that are driving only because it is so easy to drive everywhere. But when you make it easier to walk and easier to cycle, you actually draw some people out of their cars and onto bikes or onto the foot. And that actually reduces the amount of car traffic. So this is, uh, you don't have to read the whole thing, but this is just a list of some cities in North America that have converted to two-way in the past few years. We're not alone. Um, uh, anyhow, that was uh, very brief. But uh, So Hamilton today, um, as I've mentioned, our streets cater overwhelmingly to cars. Uh, we've got multiple one-way driving lanes, high vehicle speeds, very few bike lanes, narrow sidewalks, and very few pedestrian crossings. So we're looking tonight at uh, making as a first move, looking seriously at Queen Street and Cannon Street. Now this is a photograph of, this is looking south on Queen from Herkimer. As you can see, uh, at the bottom of the escarpment, it's actually a two-way street. It's got two lanes in each direction. This was taken in the middle of the afternoon on Friday. Um, not a lot of gridlock that we have to worry about. This is the exact same street looking north from Herkimer. Uh, it switches to a one-way street southbound. So if you're coming down um, the Garth Street access 
and want to, say, drive downtown, you can't. You suddenly at Herkimer either have to turn down Herkimer and go down Hess or some other way, or you have to race down Stanley and try not to catch air off the speed bumps that they installed there to stop people from racing down Stanley. Uh, Queen Street is kind of a no-brainer, to be honest with you. Uh, we've got lots and lots of room. Again, this is taken at the same time. It was about uh, 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. There's one pedestrian crossing, and there's no pedestrian crossing there, but people are going to cross when they have to cross, and there's no traffic. Uh, this is a view east on Cannon Street from James. This was taken again in the middle of the afternoon. So thank goodness we have these massive multi-lane one-way streets because otherwise where would all the cars go? The thing is we know what to do. We've been told over and over and over again. Uh, this was uh, a visualization that was done for Main Street West uh, earlier this year by uh, Factory, which is a graphic design company in uh, southwest Hamilton. You've got separated bike lanes, you've got trees, you've got curbside parking, you've got two-way traffic, you've got pedestrian-friendly sidewalks. This is not really hard stuff to do. We just need the political will to make it happen. Um, so I'm not going to read through this, but um, you know, as Councillor Farr mentioned, we've been talking about this for a long time, since 1992, 1996, the downtown ideas charrette, uh, 2001 was putting people first. 2005, we had the GRIDS growth strategy, which was the city's um, long-term growth planning. Uh, 2007, you know, we've been studying this and studying this and studying this for many, many years now, well into the decades. And uh, it's time that we take all of the things we've learned from all the studying we've done and put it into practice. Um, this is just a quick note. In 2002, the city uh, did a study on traffic, uh, automobile traffic in Duran neighborhood, and they found that 40% of vehicles were exceeding the speed limit on minor arterials. 200-plus uh, vehicles a day were traveling at greater than 65 kilometers an hour. Again, this is through urban residential neighborhoods. Um, and they concluded that the Duran streets have way too much lane capacity. Um, this is, again, I'm not going to read it, a list of some of the uh, experts, engineers, planners who have come to Hamilton in the past few years and told us what we've been telling ourselves as well. Um, we're getting it from the World Health Organization. Uh, the Ontario coroner recently did a study and concluded that we need to focus on building complete streets so that pedestrians can cross the street safely without being killed. Um, and uh, in terms of public health, uh, I know uh, Sharon McKinnon is going to talk a lot more about this. This was a study that was just done in Toronto, and uh, what they found was that people living in streets that have low walkability are a lot more likely to get diabetes than people who live in more walkable streets, and that's after controlling for income. Um, again, quality of life. You know, uh, the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, which hasn't um, come out with a position on two-way conversion yet, but they did a study earlier this year on walkability and economic development, uh, and they concluded walkable environments should be viewed as economic infrastructure that attract employment and should be invested in accordingly. Uh, the International Village BIA just uh, earlier this month came out formally in support of two-way conversion. Uh, they said that there's no greater obstacle to the success of their businesses and there's no single issue that could be fixed more easily than converting Maine and King and, and Cannon to two-way. Um, finally, um, this is a list of the... Uh, the streets that were supposed to be converted as part of our transportation master plan, a lot of them are still outstanding. And uh, so, you know, I've been talking over and over about, you know, we've been hearing this and hearing this. We've got experts telling us we've done studies. So why has it not happened yet? Um, we've got policy. We've got the evidence. We've got lots of expert advice. There's something, and then we're successful, right? So what's that missing ingredient? And of course, what's missing up to this point has been a coordinated, concerted effort of engaged citizens. We need to make it as easy as possible for our elected leaders to do the right thing and to feel like they're being supported. Uh, some of the obstacles that we're encountering, there's a general resistance to change. People are afraid of making changes. They're afraid if we try it, it'll fail. People are afraid to put their neck out. Um, you know, ideology gets in the way. Partisanship gets in the way. So we have to find ways to overcome these. And, uh, you know, the way we do that is by engaging respectfully, uh, by challenging the ideologies with real evidence from other cities and from Hamilton, uh, by building a broad coalition of support, which I hope this evening is going to help with, uh, and reducing the risk for politicians. You know, we have some very courageous politicians in the room who already support this. We need to get enough other politicians on board that, uh, that we can make this happen. You know, and then we work towards a majority that gets these things accomplished. 
And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Ryan. And Ryan McGreal will be around for our Q&A, which is the second half of our public meeting tonight. Uh, coming up next now to the main podium is Sharon McKinnon. She is a public health nurse with the City of Hamilton, here to explain the pub public health benefits of complete streets. And as Sharon makes her way up, we'll uh, ask that uh, everybody remember that during the intermission, you uh, fill out your uh, cards if you do want to get involved in our public EA process. Um, They'll be available on that table just as you go out the door. The intermission will be brief, but you can fill them out during the second half. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, welcome our Director of uh, Transit, Don Hall, who's in the crowd. We very much appreciate Don's presence tonight. He's here to listen. And uh, Larissa uh, Skripniak is also here from uh, Public Works. Hi, Larissa. Thank you very much for being here. And I see a lot of folks from both uh, Ward 1, 2, and I think a few 3 uh, neighborhood associations as well. So. Our public health nurse now on the public health benefits of complete streets. Was there a, an order issue here? Did Stephen? Okay, you know what? You may take a reprieve, Sharon, and we'll let our guys, uh, we'll let Steve and Peter, I understand you're presenting together? No? Okay, Steve, you go up on your own now. Steve Malloy, to provide some context. I was just giving you three minutes to do an introduction. I, I know, I my, my apologies, but I think it would be helpful if there's... Provide context, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, sure, go ahead. So, and I don't have a big fancy uh, presentation, my apologies for that, I'm a pretty dry speaker too, so I, I really appreciate you guys uh, having the time to, uh, to come out to these meetings, and that's one of the difficulties that we have, is that the public engagement uh, aspect of it, and thank you, Ryan, for highlighting that, because that's a very important part that we uh, need to improve on. So just a little background, myself, Steve Malloy with uh, Public Works. I'm, uh, my, my title role is Transportation Master Plan Implementation uh, Manager, I guess. So I'm Project Manager, and it's a fancy title, but really what it is is monitoring what the Transportation Master Plan has done, and that's from the, the citywide Transportation Master Plan. Um, so we have a bunch of monitoring um, uh, indicators and that type of thing that goes along with it to see how well we're doing in our last ma uh, Transportation Master Plan, which was started in 2005, then uh, Council approved it in 2007. Well, a lot has changed since then, uh, and we're, we're having these changing uh, dynamics and, and complete streets was something that was kind of in its infancy at that time. Uh, and those elements are in the 2007 Transportation Master Plan, but they aren't really uh, stated that clearly, and we've kind of done some things in that direction. So really this is an opportunity in 2013, hopefully we get uh, the, our capital budget approved for that, uh, to do an update and to incorporate uh, the concept of com uh, complete streets and, and two-way conversions from a holistic perspective from the city to see how well uh, the transportation network uh, will operate for, for all modes of, of transportation, because that's really what Complete Streets is about, is to accommodate a balanced transportation system that accommodates all modes of travel. Uh, and really that has a lot of significant uh, environmental benefits and, and health benefits, and that's why the, that's kind of the context related to that. And also the concept of travel demand management is giving people modal choice. So then everyone's not uh, limited to being into an automobile. They can take transit, they can take uh, rapid transit, they can take go train, they can walk or they can bike. So all these type of things uh, go into the transportation master plan from a, a citywide perspective. And also our, our, we have to uh, address our growth changes because we've identified uh, many years ago that uh, we'd be growing a lot faster than we actually are. So some of our assumptions in the transportation master plan actually are probably uh, a little bit more uh, con uh, conservative than what they need to be. So we need to update those numbers and really uh, see how the, the transportation system is going to operate in the next 20 years uh, based on this update. So to get to that point, we have this process called the environmental assessment process. And it's uh, somewhat complicated, but I'll, I'll simplify it as best as possible. Really, the environmental assessment process is intended to provide a screening criteria to look at all the things that we're considering, all the different alternatives, and have some measurable uh, indicators of what brings the best uh, balanced solution to our, our, our issues. So that's probably, in a nutshell, the most simple way I can explain it. Uh, I'm, I am very happy to uh, go into more detail on a one-on-one -on -one basis, probably a little bit more uh, easier to do it that way. Uh, but again, as part of that process, we have our, our uh, compulsory uh, uh, public meetings that they tell us to do, but 
really what we find is that's not good enough, and we need to do a little bit better job of doing that public engagement and, and, and engaging people into a conversation rather than uh, uh, a dull meeting with panels that people don't really care about, they're not really engaged about. So what I really want to learn from everybody in this room is how to best engage you. So what are the best methods we could use, whether it's public meetings or is it online stuff, is it more focus groups, uh, or I don't know what the solution is, but I want to hear from everybody here what the best way to engage yourselves and other people in the city so we can have an intelligent conversation about all the issues to come up with something that really uh, gives us the best transportation system citywide. So I think that's my, my, my little spiel there. Okay, that was the project manager with the transportation master plan. <laughs> Steve Malloy. Uh, next up, it's Peter Topolovich. Peter is the project manager with the Transportation Demand Management Office. He's going to talk about balanced transportation. Peter? Yes, and I, I think we were, uh, someone said, congratulations on your presentation and good luck. And I said, well, we're really giving extended introductions. So, uh, But I have a few slides just to provide some connection between what Steve said and what the job that I do. And we all know there's a Hamilton official plan, and that guides all, all land use planning for the city. And then that really leads into the transportation master plan, which really breaks down this official plan into what we're going to do for transportation and the transportation sector. And that's really what Steve uh, oversees. And of course, it has guiding principles and implementation plans. And then there's sustainable mobility and transportation demand management. And these are sort of some of the implementation strategies. I think one important part coming out of the TMP and its planning since 2007 is that we've hired a person to uh, implement part of that, which is the TDM project manager and me. So I'm a little biased, but I think that was a good, good step. And some people, <laughs> actually Steve and I like to, like to say that uh, if Steve is the bread, then TDM and myself is the butter. So if that's another way to look at it. But what is transportation demand management? And beyond this slide, how many people have heard of the term TDM before, just as a, a poll? So you guys, a fair, fair few of you are engaged and you heard this, it's really just a buzzword, uh, but it breaks down to be something really simple. And it's incentives, strategies, and policies to reduce travel demand. And when I say travel demand, we really want to uh, decrease the use of single occupant vehicles. That is, vehicles that have only one person in them, or not, that vehicles that are not being fully utilized. And we ask very basic questions. Uh, weather. So when we're talking about a trip, do we need to take the trip at all? Can we telecommute, uh, work from home? Uh, trip chain, so do three or four trips in, in, in one trip so that you don't have to do, do those all as separate trips. We ask why, uh, what is the purpose? So understanding how people are getting to where they're going and why they're going there. Well, we ask when, can we shift people's trips? So rather than everyone leaving at eight o'clock, people will leave at different times. Uh, and then of course we ask things that I think we're more familiar with, where? Uh, are we looking at the street level, the citywide level, and how are we going to form our plans based on uh, what we're focusing on? And of course, how, which is the most salient of TDM. Uh, there's many modes, and we talk about the combination of these modes. So really, I think Complete Streets really focuses on uh, the where and how. It's part of that part of uh, TDM. But TDM has really evolved, I think, into uh, sort of a, a more multimodal, more connected realm. My fancy graphics, uh, is sustainable mobility. And this really, the sustainable mobility wheel, sort of takes into account all the different aspects of uh, TDM, the transportation master plan, and then the things we're talking about tonight, which is complete streets. Uh, for instance, and I'll start with schools, workplace, and neighborhoods. We do a lot of programs to help them manage their travel demand. The Smart Commute program, I think many of you are probably hopefully familiar with Smart Commute. That's an employee uh, program that helps employees at different workplaces uh, travel more sustainably to work. Uh, we have a health and environmental connection, especially with obesity and air quality. And I know this is really the build up to Sharon's presentation on health and complete streets. But really, I think what's most important is that it takes a network approach or a systems approach. And I, I think it's really important to think about that everyone, no matter what trip they're taking, is a pedestrian first. I know you've probably heard this before, because even if you're a driver, at, at some point your trip includes a, a walk. And really trying to understand how these modes integrate together. So if you're, a, if you're a, taking a bus trip, you're also walking and you might be on your bike and then you might take your bike on the bus. And so TDM really tries to understand how these things all integrate. 
And that really, when we talk about modal, modal integration, we're also talking about the policies to, to I would say, in, incentivize that modal integration and incentivize the use of these different modes. I think Complete Streets comes, uh, is really a, a key component of that because if we're going to ask people to take transit or walk or cycle, we have to make sure that the streets in the city uh, will accommodate that use. And that's really where achieving the balance comes into play because our streets, and some streets better than others, and in various different cities in North America, some streets achieve that balance better than others. And I think it's really a street per street um, analysis in terms of what should that street be doing and how should that street be getting people around town. And so I think that's really what TDM can offer, is to understand how we analyze the street so that if this street is a, you know, has more pedestrians or is going to accommodate pedestrians, are we doing wider sidewalks? Are we looking at bike lanes? Are we looking at uh, a two-way street versus a one-way street? All these different things I mentioned are, are part of our toolkit for complete streets and in integrating uh, TDM and then modal integration as well. So I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah, just an, I think I've mentioned connectivity between modes, but also that the goods, the goods movement uh, aspect of that. So again, there's that balance of not just car drivers and, and trucks, but also pedestrians, cyclists, and walkers. And I think that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I just want to thank everyone for coming. I think it's sometimes hard for uh, staff to be able to engage so many stakeholders at once. So I think this is a great opportunity for us. And thanks to the councillors and uh, Keenan and uh, Ryan as well. Thank you. That's Peter Tobolovich. He's the uh, project manager with Transportation Demand Management. And uh, we thank him very much for his attendance. I know it's not easy to engage a large group at once. Sometimes I've been with Steve where it's a small group and it's maybe even more difficult. It depends. Uh, but uh, we do appreciate your time here. In just a moment, Sharon McKinnon's going to join us, the public health nurse. Long uh, anticipated uh, presentation from Sharon. We yeah, do appreciate exactly. her attendance too, but I'll remind all our viewers on Cable 14 that you're watching a public meeting uh, tonight uh, from uh, council chambers at City Hall. Our focus is uh, two-way and complete streets. In just a few moments, we're going to hear from Ward 2 Councillor Brian McHatty, who moved a mid-September motion on this subject on uh, getting um, uh, the public engaged in the form of a study group. That motion uh, supported uh, unanimously by council, and uh, we'll have... Uh, much to discuss on that and hear from Brian in just a few moments. But first now, it is uh, our public health nurse, Sharon McKinnon. Sharon. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I'm going to be addressing some of the health issues related to complete streets. So the built environment, which basically is everything that's man-made from our streets and our wires and our subways and our transportation systems, um, and basically the way that our built environment is created affects our health. It can affect physical activity, whether or not we have the opportunity to uh, engage in physical activity, if there's a sidewalk to walk on. It um, affects the uh, environment, such as air, air quality and water quality. And it's already been mentioned by Ryan, the issue around safety, how our built environment is uh, made can also affect our road safety. And also around health equity, so how our uh, built environment is made can influence um, our health equity. You may have heard this term, uh, physical activity, being engineered out of our, out of our lives. Um, this, you've probably seen this uh, fitness piece where they've got the stairs leading up to the fitness center, and that's just a classic example of how um, we, you know, we really don't do a lot of physical activity. It's, it's almost easier not to do it today. Um, I don't have on here is uh, all the time that um, children and adults are spending in front of screens, which is very sedentary and uh, doesn't involve a whole lot of physical activity. Physical activity plays an important role in the health and well-being of our lives. It's good for our health. It helps with healthy growth and development. It prevents chronic diseases like cancer and type 2 diabetes heart disease, overweight and obesity, and osteoporosis. Physical activity can make us stronger, it gives us energy, it can decrease stress, and it can prolong 
our independence as we grow older. The Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines recommends for adults, anybody 18 and over, to accumulate 150 minutes of physical activity per week. And that can be accumulated in about 10 minutes, bouts of 10 minutes or more. And it's fairly disturbing to note that only about 15% of Canadian adults get that 150 minutes of physical activity per week. When we look at our children and youth, it's recommended that they get 60 minutes of physical activity uh, a day. And when we look at our statistics uh, across the country, only 7% of children and youth um, meet those Canadian guidelines. So it's fairly uh, concerning. When we look at some of the information that's come out of our Healthy, Healthy Active Kids uh, Canadian uh, report card, they put a report card, card out every year, and 46% of Canadian kids get three hours or less of active play per week, and that includes weekends. 63% of Canadian kids' free time after school and on weekends is spent in sedentary activities. And 35% of kids, 10 to 16, use active transportation getting to and from school. If we break that down, 33% walking and 2% biking. And if you compare that to a few decades ago, the decrease is rather dramatic. When we look at our obesity and overweight, um, for data here in Hamilton for 2007, this is based on self-reported data for individuals 18 and over, 59.8% of Hamiltonians are either overweight or obese. That's in comparison to about 50% at the, at the province, which is a, a statistically significant uh, difference. When we look when we look at uh, travel, and Ryan alluded to this in his slide where he was uh, talking about uh, traffic, um, everybody travels, whether it's getting to uh, school, work, play, running errands, everybody travels, and they travel in different ways. They can walk, they can cycle, they can use their wheelchair. Um, it may be a truck for goods, goods movement, it may be a just a vehicle, a car, to get to and from. How people travel provides a really great opportunity for interventions that can impact not only individual health, but also community health and the environment. So it's sort of looking at that health at a population level. Creating opportunities for cycling and walking can potentially have a positive impact on health conditions such as obesity, and it can also have a positive impact on our environment. If there's more people out walking and cycling and taking transit, it means there's less people in cars, which could decrease emissions, which is going to be a good thing for all of us. Ryan also talked about the uh, safety issues related to traffic and the uh, injury rates and how that is impacted on the different speeds. So I won't go into that. In addition, walking and cycling out on the streets can lead for more opportunities for social interaction and, co and community cohesion. And this, in turn, has shown to have a positive impact on mental health. When we look at improvements on the street, they can lead to increased pedestrian traffic, which in turn can lead to a good, economic, good, good things for the economic pieces in a neighborhood. So complete, when we look at complete streets, this could be a great opportunity for everyone. Ryan has talked about what complete streets are, and he had some great visuals up there. I just want to reiterate the benefits of complete streets. They improve the safety. We talked about that. 
It encourages cycling and walking. That's a great thing for health. Complete streets can lower transportation costs for families, and that can be a good thing. Complete streets can foster strong communities by having the social interaction on the street. And also, complete streets are environmentally friendly. Some, some studies have shown that cyclist injuries and collisions with automobiles can be reduced by up to 50% by the creation of marked on-road bike lanes. The construction of a raised medium, curbs and sidewalks has been demonstrated to reduce the amount of time during which pedestrians are exposed to traffic and therefore risk of collisions by 28%. Streets that are designed for pedestrian safety often produce safety for drivers as well, and Ryan alluded to this as well. So you probably recognize this as a before and after shot of York Boulevard. The picture on the right is a good example of a complete street here in Hamilton one that is designed for all users, vehicles, transit, walkers, cyclists of all ages and abilities. There's an opportunity to create and modify the built environment so that it supports healthy communities. A variety of stakeholders working together will be necessary for this to happen including citizens, community groups, multidisciplinary professionals, municipal, provincial, and federal governments, NGOs, and other partners. Together, we can work towards streets that provide safe, convenient, efficient, and accessible use by all people of all ages and abilities. Thank you very much. City staffer from Public Health, Sharon McKinnon, thank you very much. I'm going to ask Ward 3 Councillor Bernie Morelli to come down and maybe uh, take Judy's seat or Brad's seat, whichever one you wish. And while he's making his way down, we appreciate he's been in attendance for some time since his uh, Hamilton Police Services meeting, ladies and gentlemen. I want to also recognize uh, a few people that are here tonight in the gallery, and their attendance is most important to us, too. I can see Daryl Benders here. Uh, he works on our bike lanes with the City of Hamilton. Nice to have Daryl. David Premi uh, in the gallery as well, the award-winning local architect uh, who just had a plug, uh, I think, on one of the slides we just saw. And he's also the chair of the Hamilton Arts Council. Among other things, he's been very busy at as a Ward 1 resident who's active with his business in downtown. Uh, Keenan Loomis is here from uh, MIP. Hi, Keenan. Thank you very much for coming and, and helping us organize this meeting uh, as a representative of Innovation Factory. And I also see the CEO or COO or both, David Adames. Very important that you're here. Very significant to have you in attendance in the gallery, representing, of course, the Chamber of Commerce. And I know you continue to work on the subject before us tonight. So uh, it's key to have you in attendance. And I think it's also key that we have so many representatives from the many neighborhood associations and both uh, wards one, two, and three. And uh, with that, here to speak on behalf of his residents uh, from ward three, a man who's busy in his ward right now with more conversions than uh, the Calgary Stampeders were converting at the 100th Grey Cup, Councillor Bernie Morelli. Thank you, Jay. And uh, I'll be very brief. And certainly, uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, you and, and Brian and working on this uh, very critical topic. And certainly for all those that are here tonight to present. Uh, uh, it's certainly a, a continuous uh, learning experience for me. Uh, you know, I think that, and I apologize, I wasn't here earlier tonight due to, uh, you can appreciate the fact that we're trying to put together a police budget that uh, we can uh, we can sell, and quite frankly, the challenges are, in that area are substantial as well. But nevertheless, I mean, for me, it's a learning experience. Uh, this uh, this topic, it's, it's a very, we're living in very changing times, and, and it's very a, a, a dynamic topic, and I think that we need to recognize that uh, as our environments change, uh, certainly being here and having uh, 
lived uh, all my life in this community for some period of time now. I've seen the change, you know, when I uh, was employed as a senior executive at DeFasco uh, with 13,000 people and Stelco uh, with 18,000 people at one point in the north end, just that alone. Uh, you know, in the way traffic uh, moved and how people thought it during those times is certainly something I'm aware of, and I'm also aware of the fact that today we we have uh, gained some very critical experience uh, just in the topic of uh, physical activity in itself and the focus that we have on not just safety, but the fact that people's physical conditions have changed and how we need to adapt to uh, present times is certainly something that's right before uh, me and certainly uh, very appreciated by me and certainly... You know, I, I think the key term that I, I heard tonight uh, for me was the fact that uh, what are the things that need to be done, and I think engagement of, of the citizenship uh, to see the benefits of, of this, uh, the, these changes that we're anticipating, not only for for now, but moving forward. So I think we're, uh, we're in the right uh, mode, and we're, uh, we're beginning at the right point, and we just need to continue to um, pursue this. I, I have been working, um, I think this is a part of a, huge picture. I, I work with the Bicycling Group and to date I've been able to work closely with them and do everything they've asked me to do. I think the most recent, uh, Daryl Bender's here tonight, the most recent uh, change was uh, certainly on Victoria North. Um, I can tell you that I'm working, uh, we have worked uh, on the obviously the, uh, the Wilson Street uh, conversions as the extension that uh, we're looking currently uh, with the A's that we're doing Wentworth South, we're doing Sanford South, we're looking at Birch uh, and Sherman and uh, Victoria North as well. Uh, a lot of my focus too incorporates the fact that we've got to find ways to allow people to move in this community uh, with their bikes as well as their cars as well as be able to walk and, and I think that the concept of complete streets makes full sense to me and I won't even get uh, into the concept of LRT where that fits. But certainly I think transportation is uh, for me the, uh, the real critical factor moving forward for this whole province quite frankly and I see ourselves as a region that uh, will develop and will develop according to how quickly uh, we uh, adapt with a good transportation model. Um, and so you know the, the other piece that uh, is uh, very much in the forefront for me is uh, certainly the continuing work of, of Barton Street in uh, and, and how, you know, we have two way down there, but we need to, uh, and so I'm working closely with uh, uh, Glenn Norton as we uh, have a $100,000 program to look at some uh, changes that, uh, potential changes there as well as I expect to be announcing very shortly that we'll do a charade, I hope, uh, threat uh, with uh, look, seeking to engage um, uh, community and, and, and citizenship to, to, to see what we can do um, to turn that into what I've always envisioned. I look back uh, some 20 years now when I took Bill Powell down there for the first time and envisioned the street of the universe. And in many ways, it's, it's taking that form, but it needs to, be, to push, be pushed a little bit further. And certainly, I, I've always seen a terrific hook between James Street, the harbor front, and, and Barton Street. And certainly, while we've, been, while we've been looking at that and working towards that, obviously, Ottawa Street has completed the loop. So... I'm very pleased to be here tonight to be able to express some of the things that we're doing, and, and I want to just salute you and, 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 and everyone that's engaged in this process of uh, trying to do the right thing for now and, and for those times moving forward, and I'm pleased to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Council. <laughs> is that $100,000 study, Bernie, is that from uh, Kineski's to Springy's or Frisco-Lanty's to Springy's? I, see it, I might be part of that. frisco uh, All right, thank you. That'll be great. All right, we're looking forward to that, and uh, uh, that's a significant uh, first step, and certainly I think all the pieces are in place. Next up, it's Councillor Brian McCaddy. He's going to introduce the concept of stakeholder study groups and share his presentation on the process, past and present, and also his perspectives. Uh, that start with uh, this slide. I'll let him... Uh, read it out, but uh, I don't know if it's a direct quote, but we'll find out in a second. Ward 1 Councillor Brian McCaddy, ladies and gentlemen. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Farr. It's great to uh, be here tonight uh, with everybody. Thanks a lot for coming. It's, uh, it's a great turnout uh, this evening. We uh, organize these meetings, and you're never entirely sure how many folks are going to uh, turn up, but this is a, a wonderful turnout uh, this evening as well. And it's great to follow all the uh, speakers uh, earlier in this evening. Uh, a bit of a, uh, perhaps a, a, a funny uh, opening uh, slide here for my presentation, but, but I, I think it's uh, when we listen to, uh, to Ryan's presentation in particular, he went through a lot of the studies that have been done previously, and obviously a lot of them have been done over the years. Uh, 
early comments by that retailer back in 1952 who uh, questioned uh, the uh, one-way streets at that point in time. And we've been through an awful lot of studies uh, since that time. And I think we really need to, uh, to look at whether we're getting anywhere, uh, whether it's time for a substantive change in how we approach uh, transportation planning in Hamilton. I'm going to try and talk about that tonight and, and make a few suggestions uh, if I can. So just uh, looking at the, uh, the recent studies, uh, we, uh, you heard the term uh, Councillor Farr referred to it a couple times, the, the TMPs, the Transportation uh, Management Plans, and I've uh, been through uh, TMPs in each of the Ward 1 neighbourhoods, uh, Ainsley Wood Westdale in 2004 I think it was, and then followed by Kirkendall uh, a couple of years later, and we're just uh, going through the Strathcona neighbourhood uh, plan right now. And then the citywide plan, which I guess I had 2005 up there, it was 2007, was it? Uh, 2007 was finalized. And we're just preparing to, uh, to redo the citywide plan. And in the citywide plan, we set uh, targets for how we'd like to see uh, the modal split uh, change. And what I mean by modal split is looking at uh, how many folks are, uh, are riding their bikes, how many folks are taking the bus, how many folks are walking uh, versus how many folks are taking uh, their car. And in that 2005-2007 uh, citywide plan, there were, were targets placed there. And to this point, anyways, in terms of the data we have so far, uh, it looks like there's been no real change uh, in the uh, modal split uh, throughout the, the city. Uh, and I should put an a, a asterisk be, beside that comment uh, in the sense that uh, we're uh, waiting for more results so the Transportation for Tomorrow survey, which gives us that information, uh, is set to report next year. So we're hoping it's going to change. We're hoping there's been some impact. But again, back to that point, uh, if we're doing all these studies and we're taking a particular approach to transportation planning in the city of Hamilton, we're really not seeing the changes. So time, time for a change. So public participation, I, uh, I bet you almost everybody in this room has been part of some form of, of public participation. You're here tonight uh, in the city of Hamilton. And we've got, I think, a pretty uh, interesting record. Uh, I uh, started getting involved in, in this kind of work in 1986 uh, with the Hamilton Harbor Remedial Action Plan. And we had, uh, I think it was 43 stakeholders on the stakeholders committee to uh, develop plans to clean up the bay. Uh, and as you know, we just, uh, we're just moving ahead on Randall Reef. Uh, we just got the funding for Randall Reef uh, this month. Uh, so we're still working on cleaning up the bay, but we've made substantive uh, changes. The Vision 2020 process uh, was the largest pu uh, public participation process in Hamilton, uh, starting in 1990, wrapping up uh, in around 93, with thousands of Hamiltonians offering uh, thoughts on, on what they want to see happen in this city. And, and some of that was about transportation. On a regular basis, we have uh, open houses on a variety of uh, plans uh, in the city and, and uh, public information centers, uh, various public meetings. Uh, lately, we've got into this uh, community liaison committee uh, language, and you're, you're probably hearing a lot of buzzwords tonight, but that's uh, guided particular developments uh, uh, in Ward 1, the Good Shepherd Center uh, being one of the large ones. Uh, we're, we're doing neighborhood planning right now through uh, a number of uh, neighborhoods that were identified in the Code Red uh, work in the Hamilton Spectator, uh, McQuesten neighborhood and, and Beasley and others uh, working in a different style. Uh, we regularly interact with the neighborhood associations, the three in my area, the six in, in Ward uh, 2, I believe, Councillor Fire, and, and a whole series in, in Ward 3 as well and across the city. And lately, for me, and I think I'm going to jump off on this point tonight when we're talking about transportation planning, is I had the opportunity to look at uh, this concept of participatory budgeting with the area rating funding uh, that each of wards one through eight have available now. It's $1.2 million in 2013, $1.6 million in uh, 2014, and the same number going forward into the foreseeable future, and the opportunity to allocate those funds for capital projects uh, throughout the wards. And we went through a, a, a process where we had 20 folks in, uh, in Ward 1 uh, sit down and develop a, a participatory process 
uh, to identify uh, capital projects, uh, to have citizens in Ward 1 identify capital projects, and then to put it out for people to vote on. We had about four to 500 people involved uh, in the voting on that uh, this year, and I think some really good results uh, in terms of the projects that they chose for Ward 1. And uh, we'll, we'll start implementing those uh, in uh, very shortly in 2013. So I think that was, for me, was a really enlightening experience, uh, uh, asking folks to come around and actually design a process, not to say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hold a public information center. We're going to hold open houses. Uh, no, what, what should we be doing? Designing a process right from scratch on how we're going to get people's feedback on, uh, on, uh, on capital projects from Ward 1. So I think thinking about that and, and adapting that kind of thinking to transportation planning, I think over time in Hamilton, we've, uh, we've evolved to sort of a, an expert approach to, uh, to consultation and to doing planning. Uh, and in my experience, uh, and particularly in the transportation field, that's involved hiring professional consultants uh, and uh, guided by city staff with, with citizen input. And, and I've put it in that order because uh, that, that tends to be the, the level of power or the level of influence. In politics, you're always thinking about power, who's controlling things, who's deciding on how, how uh, things are going to be uh, presented, uh, and, and what sort of feedback is going to come back, and then ultimately what ends up in a plan. Uh, and and I, I think that plan essentially favors the status quo. In, in our context tonight, it favors... Uh, you know, cars and, and vehicles uh, on, in, the, in the transportation plan. I'm suggesting citizen task force uh, to guide us uh, on Queen and, and Cannon in particular, uh, using those two examples to start with, uh, which would be set up entirely differently. It, it would be very similar to the public uh, participatory uh, budgeting process. I, we just went through in Ward 1 and, and Ward 2 is working on as well where the information is provided to the, uh, the citizens and we're, we're empowered as citizens to, to gather our own data. Um, working with city staff, and you've already heard tonight, we've got a lot of talented uh, city staff to, to draw from in terms of uh, knowledge and experience from elsewhere. But to me, that's a plan that, that inherently favors change versus the status quo. And I think a lot of people are here tonight uh, seeking change. Uh, and in this case, that would mean uh, more of a focus, for example, on pedestrians and how do pedestrians move uh, across and around Queen Street, across and around Cannon, uh, in, uh, in the Kirkendall, uh, Duran neighborhoods, uh, and then Beasley and other neighborhoods as well. So I think I've got down there, knowledge is power, and that's one of those phrases you see quite a bit. But, but if, if we... In my view, if, if, if we understand uh, what's going on on the street, uh, we've got the traffic numbers, we've got some funding maybe to, to conduct some of our own research uh, as, as, a, as a task force group, uh, and we're, we're pushing the process, we're running the process ourselves, uh, along with, some ex with uh, input from others, but, but we're not talking about the expert approach, we're talking about building a, a knowledge base within that task force, within that neighborhood, uh, to, to we actually understand the process just as well as any expert uh, who can, uh, can, can come from any part of uh, uh, Canada or anywhere else to, uh, to help us here in Hamilton. And that's the frustrating part as well. Uh, often the consultants, in my experience, take, take what they've done in, uh, in Toronto or, or Kingston or Ottawa or somewhere else, and they simply just transport it here to Hamilton and uh, put a different spin on it, and we get somebody else's ideas. I think we need our own ideas from our own neighborhoods and, and building from the, uh, from the streets uh, on up. And of course, the difference as well, the passion, uh, the, uh, the local uh, knowledge that we all have as people who walk those streets every day uh, is critical. And I think critical for council as well, the credibility that we're going to build with, with our, our study, the way, the way we're going to understand it and explain it to council, I think we're going to have a lot more power than the traditional approach. So these are just some ideas uh, on how this might unfold, the citizen task force for the two streets at this point in time that we're talking about. And these are, this is just some initial thoughts. Uh, as we did with the participatory budgeting process, we, we want to charge that task force with developing their own process. You're going to want to think about how you want to do this uh, on, on uh, Queen Street, which may be very different than what's going on on Cannon. 
also you would hope the two would be talking back and forth. But reviewing the existing data, uh, walking the street, uh, noting the challenges that, uh, that you see by walking up and down the street, the number of driveways that are going at funny angles. If we went two way instead of one way, we'd have to change that. Uh, the number of streets that are coming on to the uh, process. In the case of Queen, uh, probably Queen South being different than Queen North. Some of the issues, there's a, there's a truck route down the Queen North end that you'd want to you want to know about. Knowing the information gaps and obtaining the, the new data uh, that we need. And uh, I know that we, we've got a bit of funding now with this area rating uh, process we can actually put into those uh, studies. And there's, uh, there's a, a new company at McMaster Innovation Park that's doing some interesting uh, uh, air photo work, uh, which is sort of live uh, vehicle uh, analysis, watching the vehicles travel uh, from place to place and understanding where people want to go and why they're going uh, down Queen, why they're turning on Aberdeen. Uh, if they're heading to the 403, why don't they just carry right on down Queen in a two-way system, make a left on King. Those are the kind of things that we can understand with some of the data that we can obtain. And then reporting to our, back to our fellow citizens uh, beyond the task force itself, getting feedback, offering thoughts, and then ultimately making recommendations to City Council uh, all of this uh, interacting with the formal environmental assessment process that the city has to be part of uh, that, uh, that was touched on earlier. Steve, I think, touched on it. Um, so to me, I'll, I'll just uh, wrap up, uh, Councillor Farr, by saying there's a lot more power to, to doing this work ourselves. Uh, I think there's incredible amounts of knowledge in this room alone tonight. Lots more knowledge uh, out in the streets, whether it's knowledge that we've learned from reading or, or going to school. Uh, probably more importantly, by walking across that street uh, for the last 10 years, or in, in some cases, the last 30, 40 years, when we ask our seniors what they think uh, about some of these areas. So I think that's where the, where the power lies. And uh, we, need, we need change. Uh, that's why I'm here. And we, uh, I think what we want to shoot for, uh, you know, a couple of years from now, when people are making that list that Ryan made about all the different studies that occurred, they're going to say something different. It started, something different happened. It started that night in council chambers. We set up the task forces, and within a year, we had uh, a movement to, to complete streets or, or uh, two-way streets. And that's the timeline that I'm looking at. I know council was a little bit nervous about how fast we were moving Councillor Fire with that motion that we uh, put forward, but they did ultimately uh, provide us with the opportunity to move ahead, and uh, this is where we are tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. Mover of the motion, Ward 1's uh, Brian McCaddy. We're going to take a quick break. A reminder, you'll have an opportunity to fill out some sheets. If you want to be part of uh, this task force or study group, uh, feel free to uh, fill out the information. Let us know how to get in contact with you, and you'll have an opportunity on these sheets to also isolate on whether or not you want to be part of the Queen study group, the Cannon study group, or even both. So uh, we look forward to uh, getting you involved, and as Brian said in his closing uh, comments, it, it could very well be. In fact, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I think it does all start here tonight. So again, thank you all of you for coming and for being patient. You're next. It's the best part of the show. There is no doubt about it. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to line up over to... Uh, uh, the right of our chambers and come up to the podium and say a few words. We'll take questions, comments, and hear your concerns. If I could just now, just before our very brief intermission to get you a chance to get those forms, get a show of hands to see who might be participating on the microphone tonight. Who might uh, say a few words tonight and ask questions tonight? Nick, I know you and Okay, probably 10, 15. Okay, so we'll have plenty of time. Thank you very much when we get up to the microphone and uh, still get out of here at a, at a decent hour. So again, thank you very much for coming and thank you for viewing on Cable 14. Happy holidays, everybody. You're watching a public meeting. Uh, the focus is two-way or complete streets here at Council Chambers. And thank you as well to Ham Ant and Joey Coleman for recording, or actually uh, live streaming. Uh, tonight's very important debate at Council Chambers. Quick break, 10 minutes, we'll be back at it. Thanks, everybody.
Test check, check. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Welcome back. Welcome back to our Cable 14 viewers and to our uh, viewers on Hamont as well in the live stream. And thank you to the many members of the media, by the way, who are here this evening. I see the spec and CBC Hamilton and others. It's uh, much appreciated. Of course, a big part of this uh, in the early going is getting the word out. Uh, I uh, should mention as well that the forms are on the table as indicated, right by the main entrance coming out of or into the uh, council chambers. If you didn't have an opportunity during intermission to fill it out, but you do want to get involved, we encourage you to uh, state your name, your phone number, place your email there and how we can contact you, uh, your organization if that's applicable to you, and uh, what ward you live in, and then you'll check, please keep me informed. You'll check, I would like to participate in the Queen Street Task Force, or I would like to participate in the Cannon Street Task Force, and then if you have any suggestions, uh, uh, which will encourage the community to participate in this discussion. We'll look for those too. So they are available right there at the entrance of uh, council chambers. All right, let's get going with the uh, public portion of this public meeting. Uh, if you'd like, just come on up to the microphone. Please state your name, the ward you're living in, and maybe the street you're living on. And whatever comments, questions for our panel of experts that you may have, uh, feel free to uh, deliver them at this time. So who's up first to the podium? Uh, please again introduce yourself, which ward you live in, the street you live on, and uh, what, what it is you'd like to say. You want to speak right into the microphone, everybody. Hello. Uh, my name is Sean. I uh, live in Ward 2, and I also work in Ward 2. I have a bicycle shop on John Street. Um, and I just have two things I wanted to talk about. The first is a comment in response to Steve's question about citizen engagement, and then I have a question as well. Um, <clears throat> so. Regarding um, the question about how to engage the citizens, um, I think that we already have the feedback we need. I don't really know what more you need from us. Um, most of the neighborhood associations, I think, are backing the concept of uh, two-way street conversions and probably have for quite some time. <clears throat> Residents, those who live in the neighborhoods affected by the one-way streets, um, are generally in favor of two-way conversions. They've made their voices heard. Um, I've heard them. I'm sure that most people at the city have heard them if they've been listening. Uh, business owners, we've already seen the slides, starting in the 50s, have been making their voices heard. Um, I fear that this whole task force thing is starting another 10-year process. We've heard it. You know what we want. So what are we waiting for? Um, just a quick question, uh, how many people here kn feel like they knew most of what was presented about complete streets and the benefits? So almost everybody. Um, no disrespect to the presenters, we appreciate the time and it's important information, but we all know it. Everybody knows it. Uh, this is real, like, kindergarten stuff that we're talking about here that everybody already knows. Uh, the experts have told us for decades, the citizens have spoken, so maybe it's time to stop worrying about the input. We've got it. Um, the second thing I wanted to address was just a quick question, uh, and this kind of relates to one of Ryan's slides. <clears throat> he went through it very quickly, and I'm not personally familiar with the actual numbers and dates, uh, but there is a list already of streets that have been identified uh, for two-way conversion. Um, I think the dates are around 2007 or 2008. Ryan, for the, I don't know if those were the targets for when they should have been completed by from an earlier study or if that's when they were put on the list. I don't really know. But they're on the list already. Um, let's just do it. What are we waiting for? What, like... Really? Is it money? Is it because some councillors got phone calls from someone who lives on the mountain and is in a hurry? What exactly are we waiting for? That's my question to everybody who is involved in the city. Like, why haven't we done it yet? What's the, just one reason, the, the top reason of why we haven't done it yet. That's my question.
Any of you can answer, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Does somebody want to offer an answer? I, I can tell you that uh, it is admirable and certainly no surprise that most of the people in this room are anxious and, uh, and that includes many of us on the panel that this didn't occur yesterday and um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be talking about it now I don't think and I'm not certain that anybody has assembled in this capacity with these numbers in council chambers before and if there's one thing I gathered from the first speaker of many tonight it's that certainly uh, there's knowledge and if anything there's momentum and there's a sense of urgency in uh, obviously uh, the comments we just heard and the support we heard from the gallery following the comments so that's important I'm I'm probably correct in assuming too that there are many people that are going to view this on cable 14 perhaps tonight on the live stream as well that uh, aren't as knowledgeable and those are the people we are seriously trying to recruit here this evening there are strength in numbers and ultimately this will lead in fairly short order not 10 years not five not three but in one year a very important presentation to council one of the things too we can recognize is some work is in progress you heard Councilor Morelli mention a number of streets in Ward 3 uh, certainly a public meeting recently in Ward 2 with respect to uh, park uh, and there are other things that possibly we can implement in short order and we are currently with the city of Hamilton in the budgetary process for 2013 and there's monies available as well uh, that we didn't have before with respect to the area rating funds but those comments were important and much appreciated so thank you to our first speaker Tanya you're up next to the uh, microphone introduce yourself where you live and whatever comments or questions you might have okay uh, okay I'm uh, Tanya Ritchie I live in Ward 3 for about the last 12 years and uh, I, uh, I am the co-owner and co-manager of uh, Hamilton Guest House which is also on Cannon Street and uh, perhaps most importantly I walk my daughter to school at Dr Davey Elementary School five days a week along Cannon Street and it's, uh, it's a nightmare. I'm sure everybody who's driven it or walked it more to the point knows that. Um, and I agree 100% with what Sean has to say. Uh, I'd like to add, uh, um, sort of uh, touching on what Councillor McHattie had to say about uh, truck routes, is what I see as, besides commuters from other places in the city and outside the city who want to use downtown Hamilton as a thoroughfare, it's also a truck route. I know Cannon Street is specifically a, a numbered truck route, I think, and uh, I would just like to point out that with a little bit of extra time, trucks could take Burlington Street East out to the highway, they could take the Red Hill, they could take the Link, they don't need to use downtown as a thoroughfare. Um, it might be more convenient and that's what uh, Mr McGreal said as well, it's just, it's, it's made more convenient for them to do it. I think um, perhaps the f best way to reach out to people who are not residents and do not work or play downtown but just use it as a thoroughfare, the best thing we could do is simply educate them to the fact that they don't have to and that there are other options available to them. They can go around. It's not going to take them a heck of a lot longer. Key point, truck routes. <laughs> the majority of the industry is Wellington and east of Wellington and certainly Burlington Street with the Burlington Street overpass. Great point. I uh, had a feeling it was going to be mentioned tonight. Come on up, whoever's next. You, sir. We'll switch sides here. Your, your name and where you're from and whatever comment or questions you have. Good evening. Uh, my name is George Sabara and I live in Ward 1. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going against the flow here. I'm, in f I'm not in favor of two-way uh, streets. Um, I avoid James Street like the plague. Main reason is uh, you, keep t you keep saying that uh, the businesses want the, the two-way streets. Well, I've talked to the, uh, the, the businesses, the Wild Orchid, Venturas, Millers, Morgenstein, and the hardware store, and their business has declined, not improved. I don't know where you got your information from. And, uh, uh, and the import, one of the stores even closed, the import store that used to be on the north side of the armories. They closed because the flow of, of traffic wasn't there anymore because of the two-way streets. And every time I go on James Street, if I happen to go that way, I have no choice, it takes me forever to get up that street. 
Now, is that going to encourage me to go into one of those stores? No. I haven't gone to Miller's now in two, two or three years now. I go to the one on the mountain now because it's so busy down there. You can't find parking anymore. And uh, like I said, I don't know where you, where you got that information that the people are very happy what they got. Well, my, I did my own survey, and uh, sir, this is what I found. Uh, can, uh, Queen Street, making that two-way. Now, you show that picture of Queen Street with no traffic. Was that for a split second? Because I go up Queen Street all the time, and it's busy like how? It's so busy on Queen Street. And if you, and if you were to put that to two-way, what about the people coming off the highway? How long is it going to take them to get up to Queen Street access? What about people that live in the area? Okay, fine. If you want to speak, you can come on down to the podium, okay? Go, carry on, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I understand what you're saying about that, but I mean, you, you're going to always have cars. You're going to have it. If, if you're going to if you're going to turn Queen Street, it's just going to be chaos. Now, Dundurn Street, you, you reduce that lane going out to York Street by one lane. What's happening there now? I don't know if you've been there lately, but it's the lineup is incredible. And you want to talk about environment? Now, keeping those cars there, just constantly waiting for a light to turn green, is that good? No. When you got the traffic going through there a lot quicker, uh, you get less pollution that way. Because, uh, you know, it just, just uh, last week when I was there in, Dun in Dundurn there, I started up at the liquor store. It took me forever to get down that street. I say... Okay, you, got, you say you got all these surveys and everything that you, you, you're doing. Talk to the people. See what they want. If the majority of the people say they want the two lanes, fine then. Okay, go that way. But you say we got this survey done, we got this survey done, this happening in Ottawa. This is Hamilton. See what the people of Hamilton want. If they want the two, well, fine. Then we go with the flow, and that's great. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous right now because I'm not used to talking to people out in, in public like this. And, and uh, Cannon Street, okay, I understand that lady said that it's difficult getting across Cannon Street when you have children. Yes, you're right. It is difficult. But I would say put more traffic lights then if that's the case. And uh, I mean, I obey the rules of the road. I never speed down any of the streets. And uh, if there's more traffic lights, people can cross at those traffic lights without worrying about getting hit. Or is they're saying they're going to get hit by a car. But I'm afraid I'm going against the flow here tonight. Uh, I've been in this city a long, long time. And I, I, I could just see what, what's happening. And uh, I think going uh, with the two-way street is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Sir, actually, could you're I? going to get a response from uh, Ryan. You had oh, mentioned sorry. some of the studies, and so yeah, I, he I just wants wanted, to respond. Yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank you for coming up here and speaking. I know it can be intimidating, and I really appreciate you coming and sharing. Uh, in terms of, I just wanted to, you asked me a few questions, and I wanted to just give you some responses. Uh, the downtown business improvement area uh, is a, the, it's a, a business association that uh, accommodates all the businesses along James North and along Main, and uh, they surveyed all of their members after the streets were converted, and uh, the, uh, the large majority of businesses said that business had improved. So that's where that came from. And if you look at James North, uh, back in 2002, the councillor at the time actually was at a public meeting and he said, he was asked, you know, how come business on James North is so bad? Like, what can we do to bring the businesses back? And he said, forget about it. Business is never coming back to James North. That was 10 years ago. That street, and I've lived in and around downtown uh, for about 20 years now, and probably not as long as you have, but I've been up and down James, I've been up and down Queen, I've been up and down Dundurn and Locke, and James North is unquestionably a much more economically vital place now than it was 10 years ago. There's a huge number of new businesses opened, there have investors who've bought properties, renovated them, upstairs have a condos and apartments now, storefronts are almost all filled. James North is unquestionably in much better shape than it was 10 years ago. There may be a few businesses where their business is going up and down, but overall, I don't think there's any question that James is in much better shape. I walk, I cycle, and I drive. I do all three. I own a car. I'm not anti-car. I just think we need a much better balance. You know, as a pedestrian, I much prefer walking on James North now than I did 10 years ago. Same as a cyclist. And as a driver, to be perfectly honest, I don't mind driving on James. I'm not in a rush. I actually have time to slow down and see the street signs, which you aren't able to do when you're going by at 50 kilometers an hour. And in terms of safety for pedestrians, there's no question the street is much safer now than it used to be. And you see a lot more people walking. You see small you know, grocery stores with displays out front and people shopping there. Ten years ago, that was mostly absent. 
Okay, you're, you're saying that right. Okay, you, you say that it's improving and everything. Well, I've been around a long time too. And uh, okay, maybe the the traffic flow wasn't as great back then, but that area, I remember a time when there was a whole bunch of businesses on James Street and it was flourishing down there. There were all kinds of grocery stores. And there were a ton of people. A lot of those businesses are gone now. And uh, um, okay, you got the, the the arts down there, which is fantastic. I, I, I enjoy that very, very much. But you can look at the overall picture. You're saying that these new places are, are doing very, very well. Well, you know, you got to look at the overall pictures. What about the businesses that have lost a lot of people? I mean, how long are they going to be there? And these new places that are that are there, you know, okay, maybe they're doing great right now because uh, the, the people are it's new and everything. Will that be the same another two or three years down the road? I don't know. Like people like to. Get Get up and down a street. They like to park their car and go in. But when, when it takes them forever to go up a street, like I, I love for you to go down, start in Burlington Street and go to King and see how long it takes you. You'd be amazed how slow it is to get up that street. But and I, in the meantime, people are going to stop. Oh, I'm going to go do a little, go get something to eat now. They're probably so mad. I want to get home. Okay. Well, let Ryan respond. Thank you very much for Thank your you. time. Appreciate Thanks. you coming in. Brian? Thank you. No, I, I, again, I mean, I, I walk on James North regularly. I drive on James North regularly. It's slower, and I say that's a good thing. As a driver, I'm not in a rush to race down the street. And as a pedestrian on the same street, I'm glad that cars are not racing by. I'm wearing a pair of shoes right now that I bought two months ago at Miller's on James North. James Street, the, the one on Upper James, Upper James is a two-way street. It's not chaos. We can handle two-way streets. They exist almost everywhere on Earth. Okay, thank you. Who's next? So my name's Justin Jones. I'm actually a new resident of Hamilton. I've lived here for about a year and uh, moved from Toronto, and I'm absolutely shocked at how much I love the city. So I was one of those people that was like, I don't want to move to Hamilton. No, I'm like, I wouldn't move back if you asked me to. Uh, I live in Ward 1. I love it. Um, I live on Oxford Street. I live uh, right by York, um, right near two schools that have chain link fence and watch cars go by them at 60 to 70 kilometers an hour instead of having them slow down. Uh, we've just put up big tall fences um, around our children. This is a question of priorities. Um, it's a matter of prioritizing 30 seconds here, two minutes there versus the quality of life of people that live in the area and exist and work and play. Um, I wouldn't have moved to the place that I live now. Um, I wouldn't love my neighborhood, I wouldn't love James Street North if it was like Main Street, if it was like King Street, if it was like Cannon Street. Um, so I, I just want to emphasize that and I want to ask the councillors, how do you get, you know, I mean, it's great to see wards one, two, and three here. It's great to see the downtown wards, but how do you start to talk to your colleagues and how do you start to get them to start to change their priorities so that the 23 and a half hours a day that their constituents are not racing through our wards on these downtown highways become more of a priority to them than the two or three minutes that their constituents save by having one-way streets running through our neighborhoods? If you uh, saw the debate around our motion, you, you know how challenging that is uh, with, with our colleagues. Uh, but I, I, I go back to the, this idea that we need to, to develop the task forces with our own recommendations, real people making recommendations, real people living in those neighborhoods. Uh, and I, I think we're going to have a strong influence on our, our colleagues uh, if we get that kind of thing. I mean, the other thing that uh, one of the fellows is not here tonight, Jason Leach, uh, took all the city traffic data from the mountain and uh, the traffic volumes up there are way higher than they are in the lower city. Uh, so the question for the guys up there is, do you want uh, one-way streets? Because you have much higher volumes than we do. And the answer is obviously no. So I think over time, changing the way they think, uh, I think we've got a good opportunity to do that. I, I'm feeling uh, that we can definitely influence them. I'm glad the councillor mentioned the traffic volumes. Very briefly, uh, councillor uh, McCaddy's point number five, making recommendations to city council is how this will all wrap up very soon within the year and uh, all sorts of discussions during the budgetary process too. And around that, the one councillor that challenged us most, I think, was uh, Stony Creek's Brad Clark, and you watched it uh, on September the, uh, I believe it was the 6th, and then ratified without debate uh, at council on the 12th. But he didn't like the term implementation team. 
And I remember sitting next to my colleague, Councillor McCaddy, and oftentimes, not often, but now and again, he gets very frustrated uh, when he works so hard on something like this, important citywide uh, ramifications with initiatives like this. And he was frustrated uh, at, at Councillor Clark's wanting to change the wordage, uh, but we realized soon that it would be accepted. So even that day, if you watch that debate early, you could see, uh oh, this might be going south. We, we whisper back and forth to each other like, this might be falling off the rails. And, and we suggested that maybe it's just take what we can, take implementation team out of there. Councillor Clark, who's a, a stickler for policy and process, didn't like the idea of putting it in the hands of the public and, and didn't like the idea of following process, but if you turn it into study group, you'll get wide acceptance. That's initially, uh, that's, that's inevitably what happened, and uh, so here we are tonight with a study group that eventually will be, I think, an implementation team, and when we look at point five, maybe what we need to do is present as a group, as a task force to council, just like we did with neighborhood development. A very emotional and a very memorable evening for all of our colleagues that evening. It was a special council evening, and it wasn't us, the politicos, yammering on. It was a presentation made by those involved in the neighborhoods, and it was unanimously accepted, and it's still talked about today. So maybe when we look at that final point of the five points over the course of this short period of time to move things forward, we, we don't make rec recommendations, Brian and I or Bernie or anyone else, but maybe we make uh, the consultation, the folks involved in the process, the people that live, work, and play in wards one, two, and three, and throughout our city that want to be part of this task force, maybe we let them present because it sure worked with the uh, neighborhood development piece. So that's something we might want to look at. Great comments. Thank you very much. Welcome to Hamilton, and congratulations to the Argos on the, uh, the big victory the other day. <laughs> Originally from Calgary. All right, who's next? Uh, your name and <laughs> the ward you're from. Uh, John Neary. I live on Mary Street in Beasley Neighborhood in Ward 2, uh, between Wilson and Tannen Streets. Um, I'm here partly tonight to represent the Beasley Neighborhood Association. Our two co-presidents are not able to attend. I actually have a letter from them for you, Councillor Farr. Um, I won't read the whole thing because it would be tedious, but I'll just read the first paragraph. Dear Councillor Farr, we wish to express our support for the work members of City Council are about to undertake as part of the Complete Street Study Group. As residents of Beasley, we support the implementation of complete streets in our neighborhood and in nearby neighborhoods, including the reversion of Cannon and Queen Streets into complete two-way streets. Um, I'll make a couple of quick comments, and then I have a question. As I said, I live on Mary Street between Wilson and Cannon. Um, there's been some going back and forth between the phrases complete streets and two-way streets. Um, I think complete streets are have to be two-way. Um, a one-way street is at most a half complete street. Uh, just as an example, my son is about to turn three. He needs to learn how to ride a bicycle. As long as Mary Street remains one way and dead ends at Cannon, he can't learn to ride a bicycle on my street. That's not a complete street. Um, I, on a, still on the topic of Mary Street, um, we've done a little bit of our own uh, internal polling of stakeholders in our neighborhood. We've talked to pretty much everyone we could think of who has an interest in that street, and everyone who has a business organization there, from the Hamilton Downtown Mosque, to the Knitting Mills, to the Variety Store at Mary and Robert, to the Good Shepherd Center, to the Hamilton Guest House, they all think it's a good idea. And I think that we'll find that with every, with every one of the streets we're talking about. Um, I, I also want to say that I hope that these East End streets that somehow didn't make it onto the wish list in a lot of the previous plans we've talked about, don't get overlooked. We don't say we're going to do all the West End streets first and then move east. Um, the question I wanted to ask to Councillor Farr, Councillor McCaddy, and Councillor Morelli, and I should say that I, I'm glad that one of, the, um, one of the things that's really brought this forward is that for the first time, we have a councillor in Ward 2 who's willing to stand up and say, I think this is what we need to do for our community. We didn't have that three years ago. That's why we're all here tonight. And so thank you, Councillor Farr. Um, but you know, when someone says something like that, they're usually building up to an ask. Um, no, no, actually not, not Mary Street. Here. Here. Dale from the 
board went off and says it's okay. Sure. If we do need to exit the building, we're going to go right up the back um, and then keep going towards the board. Um, sure. I, I think I, I think it's safe to say that the real decision making doesn't all happen in these public meetings. It doesn't even happen on the floor of council. A lot of it happens between councillors. And there's a lot of horse trading that goes on on different issues that come before council. And I would just ask, are the three of you willing to make this something that is non-negotiable? That when a difficult issue comes before council, or even a project in another ward, you know, uh, beautifying Wilson Street in Ancaster, which is already way nicer than any of these streets, but bring a casino downtown, anything that might be controversial. Are you willing to say, we demand support for two-way complete streets in downtown Hamilton in order to back your own cause? Excuse me. Everybody's going to have to leave. We will likely resume, ladies and gentlemen, so you can go right out the back, the second floor. Are we coming back or what? Are we coming back, Archer? Um, you can probably just leave them here and we'll collect them. Councillor, I know this is a crazy so I, idea, but why don't we get out front, in front of the, uh, the building here? Yep. We can do it up back. Sure. Yep. Yeah. 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 That sounds like a great idea. We're going to meet outside, everybody. That's a great idea. We'll continue the meeting outside the parking lot. Nope, just the, uh, yeah, just the questions and comments.
Okay, for folks watching at home, the fire alarm will continue for a little bit longer. The meeting is resuming, and you should have decent audio quality of the people on the microphone. The alarm in the background may be a bit annoying, but meeting will restart very shortly. The vote's being called. That's okay, right. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> For our viewers on uh, Cable 14, we had a uh, fire alarm go off. You may still hear it just a little bit in the background. We continued the meeting outside. And uh, you'll recall, obviously, just seconds ago, because this has been edited, that John had asked the question, John from Beasley, uh, whether uh, uh, the wards 1, 2, and 3... Counselors would challenge our other counselors and uh, really ramp it up and tell them that if they don't support the two-way or complete street initiative, we won't support them on other initiatives. To that, Ward 1's counselor Brian McHattie responded outside as we continued the meeting during the, um, the uh, fire drill here. You said to John, Brian. Yeah, just uh, to John's point, uh, I don't think we need to do that kind of horse trading. Uh, Particularly with this uh, council that we've got now, we, uh, we've got a respectful relationship uh, amongst the various councillors and we can talk to each other about our priorities. Uh, and I think, uh, I think we're going to get more support than we suspect. Then architect Dave Premi asked the question outside, which was answered uh, in part by councillor Brian McCaddy and uh, now to be answered by our CEO of the Chamber of Commerce who has offered a, 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 to uh, answer the good question with respect to economic development and uh, why don't we formulate a stronger argument in terms of what two-way two streets means for the city as a whole with respect to economic development. And David, uh, take it away. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Farr. And hopefully folks in the... Uh and the audience can hear a little bit. I'll try and speak right into the microphone, but let me know if you can hear or not. Uh, I think, you know, I wrote a few notes down earlier in the session, and then one, one point I wrote down here is we need to be very clear on what the burning platform is or what the, what the need is. So if we think about a quick definition of public policy, it's an action or a course of action taken by decision makers to deal with a problem. So I think, you know, David, you were talking about putting an economic frame around the argument of uh, complete streets. So I think we want to be clear on what, what problem are we trying to solve, and, you, and we do have different perspectives in Hamilton about what the issue is. So being very clear on what you want to call the, the burning platform or what the need is. So I wrote down other comments. You know, Ryan McGreal talked about uh, challenge ideology with evidence. Uh, Steve Malloy talked about providing best options for citizen engagement. And uh, Councillor McCaddy said, report to fellow citizens with data, mobility and change options. So I think it is important that we, um, we do inform our uh, residents, we involve our residents so that they will invest in uh, coming together on some solutions here. So data is important and it also struck me as we listed the variety of reports that have been done over the years is maybe this is a, a question or a comment that perhaps staff could go through all those different reports and pull some summaries together 
So then we can do a bit of a gap analysis on what the information, uh, what, what information is missing. Um, and last but not least, I do want to say the Chamber of Commerce uh, will be part of the conversation. As Councillor Farr said in his opening remarks, we have yet to take a position on this, but we, will, we want to be part of the conversation. There is a letter drafted that's coming to Council. It could be as early as tomorrow. It originated with our Transportation Committee, where we're asking or recommending, sorry, recommending to City Council that they hire the McMaster Institute for Transportation Logistics to do a study on the impacts of complete streets. So that's coming to you. But... We also want to do our part. So the Helen Chamber of Commerce has commissioned a study to compare four streets. We're going to compare James North to uh, Cannon Street and Lock Street to Main West. And we're going to look at a 30-year period for a change in assessment. So we want to make, that's back to, to uh, David's comment earlier about what's the economic argument around uh, change. So we're going to look, let, let the data speak to uh, over a continuum of time. And the last comment uh, I, I do want to make about this issue, going back to the informing our, our residents, is um, you know, we have a, probably a continuum of opinion on this issue. So we have those folks that uh, are informed, I suspect most people in the audience tonight, people over here who are opposed, and there's people in the middle just need more information to make some informed decisions. So I think this is, this is an important conversation tonight and going forward. Okay, so thank you. David Adames, thank you very much. That's encouraging. Very encouraging. Uh, also working with David, Councillor McCaddy and myself on the LRT task force and we look forward to a meeting uh, uh, or later this week and LRT is a, a huge part of uh, I think what we're talking about tonight as well. Who's up next? From the uh, Duran Neighbourhood Association. So thanks very much. I'd just like to speak to two issues. First, during the presentations tonight, two-way conversion and complete streets have been talked about almost synonymously. Um, and, and, and Hamilton is kind of funny because two-way conversion is really a compromise option because it's simple, it's relatively inexpensive, it doesn't really decrease traffic capacity very much, and yet it arises a lot of fear and, and um, antipathy from, from residents in the city. And I think Part of the issue we need to sort out is why we are proposing two-way conversion. Some people might say, well, why don't we keep one-way streets and make them complete streets? And we have to say, well, you know what that would entail? That would entail taking one or two lanes of traffic away, um, drastically reducing the capacity. So that's, I think, a Hamilton-specific issue. The other thing I wanted to talk about was um, the process. And I think I'm very impressed with Brian's sketch of how the task force could, could work. Because there's been a lot of citizen engagement over the years, and I've been done my little bit through the DNA and as a regular resident. But there's often been a disconnect between policy voted by council. For example, we support the pre uh, pedestrian charter. We want to, I think, double transit use. Um, studies which get uh, citizen uh, comment and then the final council decisions and the, often the council decisions go in counter to the policy counter to the studies and I think putting this together so the study the policy and the council decision are happening um, uh, go in, in, the, in the same in the same process is a good idea but what I'm concerned about is, as we saw from the gentleman who was obviously vehemently opposed to, to two-way conversion, how do we ensure that this process is credible to the councillors outside of wards one to three? And I was thinking, do we ask them to nominate members? Are we actively soliciting members from, you know, wards 10, from wards uh, eight, nine? Um, how do we make sure that when this task force comes with its recommendation, we don't get the same response that, well, you guys in the lower city like it, but I was talking to my friend uh, in, in Ward 8, and he told me he'll never go downtown again, and uh, it's bad for my residents, so I can't support it. So I think before entering this process, we need, need to make sure that whatever process we decide on is credible for the, the rest of council. So that's, that's my main question. Nicholas. Speak right in the microphone. You don't have to shout. The audio is actually pretty good, but it, it's just the people who are live in the chamber that might be a little bit annoyed right now, but you'll be fine. Okay, my name is Gord Jackson, and uh, I'm a citizen. I live on Hunter Street in Ward 2, 
and I also do a bit of broadcasting on CFMU. A couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to associate myself with the comments we just heard. I think inclusivity is a very important part of, our, of the future consultations, and I would highly recommend uh, following uh, the diagram that was just laid out. I'm a senior myself, born and raised here in Hamilton, who remembers both one-way streets and the imposition of two-way streets. Trust me, two-way is much better. Um, there was a comment earlier from the uh, gentleman who was, as he mentioned, putting, going against the flow, uh, and he was talking about um, business businesses failing in the downtown. And my response to that is very simply, um, going back uh, into the 50s on James Street, and in those days he was talking about when it was so thriving, there were no shopping malls up the hill to go to. There was no so-called free parking. That had a great impact, this whole move out of the core, which is now starting in some places more than others to be reversed. Um, Another thing I would mention, and this is something I think a lot of seniors like myself can relate to, but particularly those who are not fortunate like me, I'm very fortunate I can get around okay, I don't have any problems with it, but there are a lot of seniors right in the downtown here, and I am think particularly on Main Street over here, who live here and are quite intimidated by the kind of Daytona 500 that we have on Main Street, and some of them who maybe go out in walkers or or are on crutches or whatever, that traffic can be very, very intimidating. Also, I think something else that might possibly be kept in mind and something we've been living with in the lower city for a long time, and that is, again, King Street, for example, and Main Street too, the traffic rushing by the way it is, it is also going by nursing homes, and that traffic is being heard in those nursing homes. And again, if any of those residents do happen to be able to venture out, if only to get into a car with loved ones, it is very, very intimidating indeed. Um, I would like to ask when we are going to get on with Bold and Hunter and a few others for conversion, uh, I really think it is about time we started getting along on with those streets instead of just the endless chit-chat about it. Um, finally, I want to make mention that Anyway, to me, with more people moving into the core, a new grocery store going into Jackson Square and other things happening, hotels going up, condos going up and the like, I think we need to get ready for more people living downtown and creating a more pedestrian bike and auto, uh, getting ready for more pedestrian bike and auto traffic and that means not maintaining again our speedways that we've got because they're only going to wreak havoc even more it's you have to calm traffic if you are going to have people living here i look at toronto and toronto's downtown is thriving and one of the reasons may very well be nobody had the bright idea of converting young street into a one-way street they had they didn't have the bright idea of doing that with university excuse me, with University Avenue either, or with Spadina, or with Bathurst, or with Dufferin. They are all two-way streets, and the two-way streets for a very, very good reason. And I think, again, we need to get back to the core of simply recognizing that people are going to be living down here, and their quality of life matters every bit as much as anybody else's quality of life in the city. Thank you very much. We have one more speaker. Dave's here representing the NEN. He's also uh, from um, the uh, Jamesville Community Neighborhood Association. Planning, planning team. Uh, he chairs that planning team. And, uh, I've been looking forward to his comments tonight. So Dave, you're our final speaker. Remember, if you have any questions too, you can direct them to our panel who are sticking it out, as well as uh, the majority of the folks that started out with us, uh, despite the, uh, the, the notice of fire. Thank you. Actually, I do have a question for Peter and an answer for you. We're actually releasing our neighborhood plan uh, December Oh, yeah, sorry, 7th. Dave. Thank you. Right into the microphone. Oh. Um, 
I actually have a question for Peter and an answer for you about engaging the public. We're actually releasing our plan at a fun fair December 7th out to the public of the Jamesville Tavern uh, December 7th. Now one of our actions that we do want to uh, strive to succeed with is the complete streets. Okay, um, if you guys would like to get like a presentation of a little booth to engage the public, you're more than welcome to. And uh, my actual question is for Peter. Earlier when you were talking, you were mentioning about balance in the neighborhoods with traffic flows. Now, with balance, there comes parity with one-way streets. Okay, usually they're paired one northbound, one southbound. Like, we have James and McNabb, which are paired together. Why, why would the city planners choose to do one street without the other, right? Same with Wilson and Cannon, they're paired. Why do something halfway without having provisions for future the other way? Like, shouldn't that have already been discussed and set out prior? I think that will come in, I, I agree, and I think that uh, looking at it in isolation might be a, uh, a problem for now, but I think when we look at the TMP, and this is a question for Steve as well, we're going to look at the whole system as a network. So if you're looking at Queen, you might also look at Bay, because they're a pair. Okay. So I think that, that would come up uh, during the, the master planning process now that uh, the ideas about Queen being converted are on the table. I thought Queen and Hess were paired. It's Queen and, Queen and Bay. But I mean, either way, I think through the TMP process, that, that will come to light, okay. understanding that as a whole system. And if you're going to make one change in the system, what happens to the rest of it? So I think that kind of analysis has to go on at the transportation master planning level. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, that presentation... Steve Malloy. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, add to that. So just to clarify, uh, Queen and Bay are, were designed originally to carry higher traffic flows, and that's why they were considered the pair. Okay. Uh, the other pair would be Hess and Caroline, so those were the pair uh, to be considered. So just to clarify that point. Okay, thank you. And like I said, I'd like to invite you to our fun fair. It's December 7th at Sir Johnny McDonald uh, in the gym. You're more than welcome if you want to bring a few boards for a presentation, engage, get support for the public. Go nuts. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, especially uh, considering the last half hour and the incessant uh, ringing in our ears. It's a very important public engagement. Uh, big start tonight to a process that uh, we hope accomplishes great things in short order and gets a majority of support once uh, presented to our councillor colleagues. So on behalf of Councillor Morelli, Councillor McCaddy and myself, Councillor Farr, and our organizing team that featured Keenan and Ryan and uh, others who were very helpful in setting this meeting up, and particularly Dale Brown from the Ward 1 office, uh, thanks again for attending. Hope you get a chance to view this and encourage others to view it on Cable 14, obviously on Cable 14 and their YouTube uh, uh, page as well. And uh, thank you to Joey Coleman as well for the live stream. This will be available perpetually now on Hamon. So thank you very much, Joe. It's great to have you in the chambers. Thank you, everybody.